Hello, good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Ernest Atto from Business With You Webinars and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have Rose Register with us today who will be discussing on the webinar entitled Enhancing Oil Recovery from Asian Fields. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Stuart Law, a Senior Reservoir Engineer at Lloyd's Register. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform on 24. This webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect, click the link you received via email to rejoin the session. All of the icons along the bottom of your screen are the interactive widgets that we have on offer today, so please interact with them all throughout the session. You can ask questions using the Q&A widget or by using the questions box at the top left-hand corner of your screen and then clicking Submit. We will try and get through as many of your questions as we can once the presentation has concluded. Please use the Help widget if you experience any technical difficulties or just require any more assistance. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Stuart. Stuart, over to you. Thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to the webinar, Enhancing Oil Recovery from Aging Fields. I'm going to introduce a series of um, discussions around... Um, sorry. Around various points, uh, late failed issues, uh, introduction to the ore process, analytical and summary with regards to mature fields. Before we start, I'd just like to introduce you to Lloyd's Register's uh, portfolio worldwide. We are a company that helps various countries around the world at different stages of economic development. And uh, at present, in terms of oil and gas, we basically function from the reservoir to refinery and beyond, following the whole supply chain through. So let's just start with the introduction. At present, the international energy state the energy states that 26% of the world's energy will be basically supplied by oil until 2040. Now, in the particular fields worldwide, the average recovery factor is between 20 and 40%, and the majority of these oil reservoirs are very mature. Now, clearly, if we are recovering between 20 and 40%, there's obviously a prize there. Recovery is key, therefore, to maintaining global industry and providing power and energy for, for, for further future economic growth. Recovery example you're currently seeing is from the UKCS, and it is at the higher end generally because we adopt water floods in this area of the world, or they have strong aquifers, or perhaps a combination of both. Now, on a worldwide scale, we are looking at maturing fields, as, as I've alluded to, and we are finding very few large fields still to find. Notable exceptions in the news would be the Gulf of Mexico. And we are now facing a higher reliance on our mature fields. Now, I would just like to introduce you to the three types of recovery from oil fields, in particular for those of you amongst our audience that are actually not reservoir engineers. Reservoir engineers consider basically recovery in two, sorry, three different modes, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary being the mode in which the actual reservoir, we drill a well into it, we produce from it, and the, the field eventually loses its energy. We can somehow enhance with artificial lift technology. Secondary recovery, is basically water flooding where we drill water injector wells and we then produce more oil through support, pressure support. Now in terms of secondary recovery we can also include artificial lift. A lot of wells in the North Sea for example are completed with future gas lift in mind and so on that basis we use artificial lift including what we call ESPs which are basically electric pumps that lift fluids to the surface. Now in terms of Mature fields, we, in most provinces, are producing from secondary recovery mechanisms. When we talk about the, the very much the popular topic of EUR, we are into the domain of what we would call tertiary recovery. This generally falls in, into four buckets, which we will allude to in the next page. Four primary types are chemical, solvent, thermal, and other methods. Currently, depending on the province, depending on your access to infrastructure, you may use 
some or none of these methods. At the moment, in our particular province, uh, on this side of the UKCS, we use polymer and low salinity as an emerging technology. Norway, um, they are currently developing more towards solvent, CO2, but they are using other methods. And thermal tends to be something that we generally don't do in the North Sea, but you perhaps do it in other parts of the world, like the Middle East, and perhaps South America and Central America. And microbial, obviously, is a, as the name suggests, is basically using microbes to recover oil. And while we have some basic techniques there, they're not exhaustive. There are a lot of EOR techniques, but obviously your choice of EOR techniques is driven by your reservoir. Now, if we just consider some of the main issues that we see with mature fields, obviously, with a mature field, you have it developed already. So anything you can do to increase the recovery will obviously benefit your field economics and ultimately your bottom line. Mature fields are three issues generally from the fields we've looked at. They have high water cut and dis water disposal issues, reservoir souring, and reservoir and well scaling. Now, in a lot of these fields you're seeing these problems in, they are a function of what is already pre-existing in the reservoir, and in some cases, what we're introducing. Obviously, primarily, reservoir souring is a biological process, and it occurs by the introduction of organics into the reservoir, which effectively cause bacteria to produce unwanted uh, gaseous, um, such as H2S. Now, a lot of fields as well that you find that are mixed wet. In the mature provinces around the world, and again, most of our experience is in the UKCS, but we have worldwide examples as well, fields might have been designed originally for a 45 to 50% recovery factor. But with the increased focus of the $100 oil in the recent past, a lot of these fields like Fulmar and Piper in the UKCS continued production. The idea being to push the field life out and produce the production tail, effectively turning the field into a washing machine where you're putting water in and you're getting whatever remaining oil can be taken out. Now, historically, there's been a lot of enthusiasm towards EOR and field applications. I would say the challenge is not just a technical one, it's a mindset. As an industry, we are very confident and comfortable drilling wells into high-risk reservoirs. For example, we've recently extended into HPHD. We struggle with EOR <clears throat> because on a worldwide basis, it's not applied to every field. The skills tend to be concentrated within certain operators or within certain individuals. Not every engineer and not every field team will have experience. A lot of the field candidates are tertiary as well. <clears throat> and obviously with tertiary fields have undergone various phases of development, quantifying the incremental <clears throat> payback time is difficult. Technically speaking, EOR is not a magic bullet to suddenly boost production. Before considering EOR, it's very important to resolve any underlying issues with your field. I want to show currently the slide that brings together the three different um, components of a field. Typically, they fall into reservoir, wells, and facilities. Now, from the perspective of an oil field, you can't treat these elements in isolation. And we see that, for example, the, the issue I've just mentioned for a mature field of produced water, it not only affects the actual facilities, but it also affects the reservoir and the wells. We see that if you have pre-existing faults and fractures, it obviously affects the reservoir and the wells. It affects your recovery. It breaks your reservoir into different compartments. Wells in particular and facilities also carry a significant scale risk. Generally, in the reservoir, you wouldn't see a scale risk. If there is any deposition or precipitation sites, they're within the deep reservoir and generally will not affect recovery. So let us touch on the three issues that I've just mentioned so far. Produce water handling, scale and souring, and reservoir access to the target remaining oil. Now, as I mentioned previously, a lot of the fields are currently 
beyond their design life. And given the fact that the reservoir wells and facilities are all interlinked, we may have integrity issues as the, as the fields get older. The reservoir, in a sense, as I mentioned, is acting like a washing machine in the sense that water is injected, cycles through the reservoir, and out the other end comes effectively a water producer with a small water cut, a sort of small oil cut. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this idea of producing the tail is basically an oil profile where it extends out. Now, in order to deal with produced water, you have various challenges. Re-engineering of the facilities is not always possible and tends to be very costly. So in, in the recent past, we have uh, come across a number of applications and uh, indeed insisted in them where we've actually applied bright water or near well bore shutoffs. Bright water is thermally activated polymer, a technique which we will shortly discuss. And near well bore implies basically the use of cement to close off areas or layers of the reservoir where oil production is no longer viable and all you're producing is water. So this example is showing thermally activated polymer as a method of treating produced water. Now if I can just focus to the comment here that I've inserted is increased water fl flood conformance. LTRO, for those of you that are not reservoir engineers, it simply means locate target remaining oil. And sweep efficiency, as we will shortly define in the efficiencies, it simply describes the movement of water behind an oil bank, pushing it towards a production well. And heterogeneity, for those that are not geologists, is simply a terminology that implies if you have a solid, how variable the properties of that solid are within it. Typically, in the reservoir sense, we would refer to heterogeneity in terms of faults, fractures, and permeability. Thief zones, as mentioned there, describe uh, a layer of high permeability where if you have an injector producer, the water will go straight from the injector to the producer, bypassing the lower permeability layers in favor of this high perm thief zone. Now, from the diagram, you can see there's three different images there, the top one, the middle one, and the bottom one. If you contrast the middle and bottom one, you can see that what the effect is you've got a change in color. That change in color towards the high perm streak that you can see at the very top is actually um, create, created by water bypassing. So you inject, tap, which is the bottom one, and it basically into the high perm layer, and it basically diverts the water into the lower perm layers, sweeping them to the production wells. Now, I'm going to introduce the concept of scaling. Now, within a scaling scenario. Um, typically reservoirs, before we inject water or other chemicals into them, they're in a state of equilibrium. This means that over geological time of many millions of years, the fluids have reacted, the chemical reactions have finished, and you have basically a fluid, either oil, water, gas, predominantly chemical reactions that we deal with in terms of scale are within the water phase, which is where they tend to reside. Now, the minute we use water injection, we change the chemical balance in the reservoir. So initially, we have a situation where the first water that appears at the producer is just after we've ceased what we call the production plateau, where we're in the sort of decline scenario. This water is then followed by injection water, which is basically from the injector wells, which breaks through the wells. Now, during this initial period of production in an oil reservoir, you will tend to get minimal scaling, although scaling will start to appear if the formation water has a tendency towards it. It's important to remember that across the world, within reservoirs, within provinces, you will have a variability in terms of the components within the water, PPT, and it's the presence of, of these components that will actually determine the scaling risk. So let's assume for a moment that we're looking at a scenario where we do have a scaling problem. In the middle time, in, in terms of the field life, you'll start to see seawater breakthrough from the injector wells. If you had the example of barium sulfate, you would have formation water, which is rich in barium sulfate, and then is then starting to mix with the injected water, the seawater, which is rich in SO4, or sorry, sulfate. Both of them arrive at, at the producer and, and commingle and eventually go in to the facilities above. Now, when we have the mixing of, of fluids like this, 
scaling tends to be a chemical process. So we, where you have a certain saturation of, say, barium and, and, and sulfate, you will then get a barium sulfide appear. It was also worthwhile to note out that not all fields will have issues with scaling. They will have maybe different scales or minimal scales, in which case, depending on your severity, as we'll see in the next slide, will determine whether or not you need to treat it. It's also important to, to, not, to note that a lot of fields, in particular the sort of older fields, if you have a situation where, if we talked about earlier with uh, primary recovery, where aquifer can support production, if the aquifer is not very dominant, and you've got water injection, you may be able to, quickly able to override the actual impact of the aquifer so that you push the reservoir into a non-scaling regime or at least a minimal scaling regime. However, if you have a dominant aquifer, the potential for mixing is much higher. Now, in a mature field, one of the, certainly the drawbacks is that you could have a situation where if you're constantly treating for scale alongside, say, your normal field production, your actual value from, you gain from producing that oil is actually impacted by the number of scale squeezes you need to do. Scale squeezes simply, we, we inject a chemical inhibitor to basically um, minimize the reactions. Okay, now, if we look at the next slide. As I mentioned, scaling typically occurs as a result of chemical reactions with components in the formation water, which is then mixed with the injected water. And again, precipitation occurs where we have concentrations. So you would expect to see that within the production system, in the well bore, in the production flow lines, and into the, the actual separator system where the fluids are being separated and concentrated together and they mix together. There are examples from the North Sea where we have seen um, significant scaling occur. For those of you that work on an oil field, if you've ever opened up a, a separator and seen inside, Scale tends to occur as quite a sort of, excuse the expression, quite a woolly, furry substance that is basically within the separator and coats the inside and any separation um, partitions within it. It's just very difficult to remove scale once it's in there. So it's always better if you identify a scaling problem, typically in a new field development, that you put sulf basically sulfur control measures in to begin with. So if you can process the seawater to reduce the potential, then that will always help. Um, the, the other thing to remember as well is with, with a production system um, in a mature field, as I mentioned, you've got SISQ, it will eat into your, your actual um, your, your profitability long term. So if you can get in at the start, it's always good. In terms of the risk as well, the risk of scaling, I mentioned that. The risk and the magnitude is determined by the initial component concentration in the reservoir water. The higher the concentration, the higher the risk. As you can see from the two charts there, they're actually quite interesting. I, it's from a current paper in uh, production. It's based upon some very simple mechanistic models with some heterogeneity in it. The left-hand model will show you actually what's happening within um, the reservoir system, and in the right, it shows the production well. Now, what's very interesting there is you'll see that the volumes of uh, precipitation in the reservoir versus the volumes in the well. Within the deep reservoir, you've got such a large volume of rock that any barium sulfate that basically is um, formed will be okay. It will, will reside within the reservoir and will not therefore make it to the producer to present a scaling risk. So in some cases, you can also state that if you have, uh, I haven't mentioned this here, is that with injectors, injectors need to have chemicals like chemical inhibitors pumped in near the injector so as to limit the potential for scaling formation around the injection well. Around the producer, we basically shut off production from time to time to do this thing I mentioned, the SISQ, known as a basically scale inhibitor squeeze. You will shut the production well in, you will push scale inhibitor down, and it will provide a near well bore um, blanketing of, of the inhibitor. And over time, as production moves into the production well, the inhibitor concentration will basically drop which is why you then monitor it, and then obviously future um, treatments. As I mentioned, it's all about concentration and depends on different parts where you are. Now, in terms of scales, barium sulfate, as I mentioned, is actually effectively a chemical reaction. Um, barium sulfate, unlike other scales, doesn't require temperature to enhance or 
um, decreases reaction. However, other scales like calcium carbonate and halite are temperature sensitive. Now, scaling within the system, as I mentioned, occurs in three different places, but it's important to remember the reason we're talking about scale is we're talking about mature fields. Scale within the reservoir can reduce the permeability, but the exact degree to which it reduces it is very much subjective and will depend upon the reservoir layering system within and also the, the initial um, permeability. We mentioned scale within flow lines and production manifolds can also occur. Now, in terms of the severity here, I've tended to sort of classify it. We'd expect scale to have a lesser impact in the reservoir, but to have more of a medium to severe impact within the well and the wellhead. The other severe impacts we would expect would be the flow lines, production manifold, and the separation train. Now, as I mentioned before, in mature fields, if you are having to treat for scale frequently, it does ask, add to cost. So in a sense, the scaling is also um, interlinked with the produced water issue. So in a sense, if you can control your produced water, you can also reduce your scaling risk. Now, we have mentioned this before in the presentation, scale prevention is the cure. So if you can do it at the start, it can be a very effective means of uh, dealing with the issues. In your field in the North Sea, we have a field that's very um, scale prone. And in that particular example of the buzzard oil field that Nexon Petroleum run, they used a sulfate reduction plant from the start of field production, in essence taking the SO4 out of the chemical reaction and limiting the potential for scale. Reservoir siring is a topic as well that's also interconnected in a sense. Um, this is to gain to do with the fact of the injection water. So when we talk about the equilibrium, we're also talking about not just chemical reactions, but also if you do introduce things like organics into the reservoir, you will feed the in situ bacteria, which will then precipitate H2S as a byproduct. To control this, generally we would use biocides, which is included within the water injection, and can basically help treat it. Now, if you already have a situation where you have a field which is evolving H2S, traditionally we would approach this with what we call an amine plant. They're used quite frequently on oil fields to remove unwanted um, gas before entering the production stream enters the pipeline or the offtake tanker. Now, another topic which is very important um, is to do with reservoir access. Re reservoir access in itself in mature fields can be an issue. When we talk about increasing recovery from mature fields, the challenge comes simply because our wells might not be in the right position. Typically, oil field developments follow a simple path. You develop the field initially where you think your best production injection wells are. You produce, you produce on this, what we call this term, a plateau, which is basically a, a flat production line. And then as we come off this plateau, we then find ourselves in a declining oil volume situation. So it's in that particular case um, that, that basically we might then say, okay, let's drill some infill wells. So you might target then infill wells to parts of your reservoir that you otherwise wouldn't have targeted, say, earlier because maybe the yield wasn't high enough or maybe it didn't fit the current design at that stage in field life. Also, if you have a history match simulation model, you may find that you've basically produced and you have potential areas to target based upon the simulation model. And it's also important to, to mention, whether it's an injector or a production well, once you take it out of the field configuration, you are, in fact, changing the water flood pattern. Obviously, exceptions accepted where you have one well in the compartment. But otherwise, if the wells are interconnected, you will have that potential scenario occurring. And as I mentioned on the slide here, the implementation of IOR and EOR schemes is very dependent on an optimal water flood pattern existing currently. Also, the, your understanding of the pattern as the reservoir engineer on the field, understanding the heterogeneity in the field, and also understanding the, the actual pathways from injector to producer are quite important. Now, we've mentioned late field life issues already. Ultimately, for any oil field, what ultimately kills off the oil field is economics, declining oil well rates and increasing OPEX. 
Now, the three we've mentioned, which would be produce water, scale and souring, and also reservoir access, we can't stop the decline, but we can, in some ways, manage the decline to effectively reduce our OPEX costs and try and extend field life. Now, as I mentioned before, we do have the situation in a lot of mature fields worldwide where we are going after the production tail, and while we had $100 oil, it was very favourable. In this new cost environment we live in, obviously getting the costs down can help to extend field life. Where we can manage that, we can manage it through debottlenecking of our systems and obviously through good oil field practice. Now, EOR has been mentioned as a, a method of perhaps doing this. Fields will always face a, a choice whether or not you decide there's any EOR prize there, whether you decide IOR is the best option, or whether you think it's too far gone to actually um, consider further work and then you eventually go to abandonment. Let's touch on a moment for the application of EOR. Frequently, when we're asked to do studies, we often find that they are, in fact, tertiary mode. Secondary mode is simply when EOR is applied after first oil and you already have the facilities in place. Therefore, the overall system application is much easier. When you be the benefits of tertiary EOR are, are very, very simple. You don't need to explore or appraise new fields. So the risk, the technical risk of actually finding the oil is, is, is reduced. There's no need to develop the field existing. Um, targets already exist and perhaps you have a good understanding of your reservoir, hopefully. And that your in infrastructure, export and markets are in place. The challenges you maybe face is that within a tertiary application, it's much more costly. Reservoir wells and facilities condition is also another factor which we have to consider because in a situation we're often faced is that the platforms, i.e. the facilities, and the wells are facing integrity challenges. This can be basically uh, seizing manifolds on the production system. It can be well casing and tubing issues. So in order for us to see the benefit of EOR, reservoir engineers quite often rely on simulation followed by um, a field trial. Obviously, the preamble to that we will discuss shortly in the OR process. But for an introduction, you, if you can look on the screen, you will see we've I've drawn a, a curve, a blue line representing the original production profile. And what you see at the straight line at the very far left is actually what we call the production plateau. So as it follows conventional decline to A to B to C, you would see that potentially in any oil field different curves obviously depending on geology the shape of the curve. Now, what, you, what the, the highlight I'm trying to highlight here is the payback time on EOR, which is also a reason that a lot of people don't feel comfortable with it. If you look at point B, the EOR is implemented, but you don't actually see the impact of it until much later. When you see the start of this orange bump, you see the orange profile goes up as you see the peak due to the EOR, and then a managed decline towards the end. Defining this, proving this to management can actually be very difficult and requires careful study followed following three phases, which we call OR. There are equivalent processes out there. Now, the OR in mature situations is also difficult within specific techniques. For example, CO2 application has its own challenges. CO2 sometimes requires facilities overhaul and wells in order for it to handle the CO2, which might otherwise be corrosive to the facilities and wells. Low salinity may also face challenges because deck space can be difficult to acquire on an old platform. You may be using your deck space to store spares and other issues. Now, the question posed as well is, is my field too mature? New opportunities in old fields obviously are faced with challenges. It's all about proving there's actually still a prize there. And within the, the habitat of remaining hydrocarbons, it can be difficult to assess. In particular, as I said already, if your drainage pattern has altered because your pattern, your well configuration has changed. In LR, we use two simple measures. Field maturity index, which is simply a function of your recovery factor divided by 
EURF. Now, for those of you who aren't reservoir engineers, RF is recovery factor. EURF is simply ultimate recovery factor. If you ever see a publication on oil and gas where it refers to the EURF, it is simply the 2P reserves before any production has really occurred. After that, it's cumulative production plus 2P reserves. 2P reserves change as a function of time and uh, will reduce as you produce more oil from the field. The second measure, field remaining life, is, is very simple. Um, as, a, as a sort of general rule of thumb, if, a, if the field is more than five years, you can consider various processes. In this example, um, I'm referring to chemical processes. Generally, solvent EOR can have a longer lead time, but it will vary because on land it can be much easier to apply solvent than offshore. If it's less than five years, consideration should be given to conformance technology. Now, Included here is a very simple workflow for stage one screening. Simply, pathways are what we require to get EOR into the field. So a field that only has production wells is unlikely to benefit from EOR without drilling injectors. And on mature fields, drilling new water injectors for an EOR scheme can be quite risky unless the operator has confidence that there is a recoverable volume there. So let's look at a, an example of a small field. Now I've chosen just an example here. Um, this is from the web. This represents the Claymore production platform and what we call the, the CAP, which is basically the accommodation platform next to it. I chose this specific example because I've actually worked previously as a reservoir engineer on this field. And you can see two things there that are subsea water injection templates. I don't know if you can see the CFE and Casway. They are subsea injection templates that introduce water into a field. Now, this field, by its geology, would probably benefit significantly from a process like bright water, but because bright water requires careful well placement, unless it's a platform injector, you're unlikely to be able to get bright water as an IOR improvement, water conformance technology, and because the Casway and CFE systems are basically fed from a master water uh, injection header, so there's no split out to the wells and there's no metering. So telling where such a process would go is difficult. However, if you were using a process like CO2 or low salinity, on the other hand, if you're applying it on a full field basis and assuming that you were happy that certain volumes would go into different reservoir layers, then the opportunity on this sort of field is, is fairly good. But as I said, the key to understanding EOR is being able to understand the pattern within the field the water flood, so where injector producer pairs or even injectors to different producers within the network, how they actually behave, and also the habitat of remaining hydrocarbons, as in where they're located within the field. And as one point I would make is that not all fields are actually suitable for EOR techniques, and it does come down to a whole combination of properties, including your understanding of the reservoir and the facilities that we've mentioned in this example. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce you to the, the ore process. The OR process is a, is a scheme, it's an overarching scheme that we currently use. LR uses a standard five gate, stage gate process for most field development plants. The OR process is designed to seamlessly sit alongside them for, for in the instances where clients wish to assess um, IOR, EOR for application to fields. Now, what I'd like to highlight is the opportunity, is the initial component. And this is a suggested workflow that I personally use and a lot of others use, where you perform initially a high-level course screening, and you then take this course screening, and then you perform an analytical analysis before then selecting techniques. We're about to show you an example. Um, it's, it's been condensed just to from the, the introduction to EOR course to let you see um, how, how simple it is. So you, obviously the next stage after you've done the opportunity is realization. You do laboratory tests, including PBT and various um, core floods, to assess potential. Once you've done that, you move on to mechanistic modeling, which can include actually modeling the core, modeling small sectors, scaling up to eventually go to a full field model. And it's after the realization you've quantified your volumes, you know what your potential incrementals are, you then go to an execute stage where you will conduct um, small, small scale pilots. And obviously then you review the pilot, if it's successful, consider full field of, uh, application.
This process dates from about 2009, and internally we have made some changes to it. Um, and certainly, it's very easy to use. So, just to highlight, the, for the opportunity stage, this is something that I would recommend to any reservoir engineer, regardless of experience, is to follow this route first. I'm very skeptical when I see people modeling low salinity in simulators where they haven't actually got any core or other data and it's done as a scoping study. And that sometimes actually with EOR models, you need to have finer simulation models than what are currently there. So I would recommend that analytically you assess the potential for EOR before then considering the simulation component. <clears throat> now, the primary aims of this stage are to identify the techniques. That comes at the end after the course screening and analytical models to basically support the analytical models support the conclusions of the course screening. And very much when you do analysis through analytical calculations, I would avoid assigning uh, definitive volumes or, or assigning too much to them until you've actually done further work in terms of the simulation. So an example here, which I apologize if the table wasn't initially there, highlights the Tabir screening criteria, which is um, pretty much standard. It's, it's been around for quite a while now. It's quite popular. And within different companies like ourselves, I'm sure within the operators, we've evolved um, different schemes, but they broadly follow the same approach. You know your basic reservoir properties, and you basically screen in. Now, I would caution, having done quite a few of these screening studies, uh, actually in the hundreds, that you should always use, as far as po physically possible, the reservoir properties of the individual layers within your field. To use averages, you tend to smear out potential. Certainly, in a number of the fields that I've reviewed over the, over the years, what you will see is that perhaps you've got maybe five layers or three layers in your reservoir, but maybe only one or two are viable for EOR. So, so if you average the properties across a layer, you may find that it actually alters the, the screen in unfavorably. And my approach would always be to try and screen in the EOR rather than screen out. This is an example from a paper we published in 2014. Now, Tabir does cover quite a few techniques, doesn't cover low salinity, in, in certainly in the 1996 paper. So from the low salinity point of view, to introduce low salinity, low salinity is simply um, ionically tuned water that enters the reservoir. So rather than introducing seawater that's rich in various ions, you perform ionic tuning to get a preferential composition, which you then inject into the reservoir. The reservoir, we generally get more oil, basically by a reduction in what we call residual oil, or SOR. This occurs due to a change in what reservoir engineers call wettability. We have basically three terms for this, so it's important that just to make you aware of those of you who aren't reservoir engineers. We have an oil wet state, we have a mixed wet, and we have a water wet. What this simply means is that the reservoir rock has a preference for one of these three types and the mineralogy as well. So we call the mineral kaolinite is an oil wet preference mineral. So that it will preferentially be wet with uh, oil rather than water. For more information on low salinity can be found in that paper and there's a lot of good publications out there. So let's discuss the base recovery factor. Now, the base recovery factor, in this example, we're using BP's methodology, which is easy to present to you because it's public domain rather than the LR1, which is very broadly similar. Different methods of obtaining the BRF, as I mentioned, are available. Smalley's version here is, has been used extensively by BP Worldwide, and they, it contains basically a number of efficiency factors. Um, EPS is basically poor displacement, the drainage efficiency, the volumetric sweep, which is a combination of aerial and vertical sweep, and the cutoffs, which are also sometimes referred to as economic cutoffs. Now, in terms of increasing our base recovery efficiency, as you'll note from the bottom there, there are two ways we can do this. We can solve our existing IOR issues, or we can introduce EOR. And in most cases, we will expect an improvement in oil recovery. So from the analytical analysis point of view, again, very much part of what we would call an opportunity um, calculation within the ore process. In this case, poor displacement um, efficiency is very common. It's basically the fraction of movable oil that you can get from the swept zone. 
in, in mature fields, this is a very significant efficiency. And uh, it's heavily influenced by mineralogy, geometry, chemistry, and hydrocarbon fluids that are present and what's actually in the oil itself. Efficiency varies very much according to the reservoir characteristics and the fluid mobility. Second one is the drainage. Now, as I mentioned before, mature fields, it's all about water flood patterns and well locations. In mature fields, this efficiency is a significant determinant to success. If we alter the well configuration, we alter the pattern. Isolated areas with hydrocarbons may not be drained if we have altered it significantly. Now, in terms of fields that have gone through development, as I mentioned, you will have initial development, you'll have an infill stage, you may then have further infill campaigns. You may find that if you're looking towards EOR in a very late uh, component of the field life, you know, towards the end, that it can actually be simply a case of EOR won't work because your well configurations are not ideal and it will take far too much um, investment to actually bring it back to near possible optimum uh, flood pattern to, re to recover more oil. Sweep efficiency. In this sense, we're, we're referring to volumetric sweep efficiency, just for clarification. So you have two components. You have aerial and you have vertical. The aerial sweep efficiency tends to be, as the name suggests, in an aerial domain. It's a long reservoir layer plane. And it's influenced principally by the mobility ratio and, and anisotropy, which for those of you that aren't reservoir engineers or geologists, anisotropy refers to heterogeneity. Also, it's very much dependent on your cumulative water injection and the pattern flood that you're currently uh, undergoing in the field. Vertical sweep, is, in a sense, as we mentioned, is very much in the vertical domain. And it's KVKH, for those of you who aren't aware of that and are not reservoir engineers, KV is simply vertical permeability and KH is simply horizontal permeability. It's a ratio between the permeability and the horizontal and the vertical direction. So in a sense, the permeability in the right-hand diagram there is showing is, is basically a product of the variation within the layer ratios in terms of KVKH. Gravity also, in a vertical sense, because you are moving between different layers, plays a part and also viscous fingering, which is determined by the actual layer properties. Come back to this, the, the final efficiency, the cutoff efficiency, is basically an economic one. The map you're seeing here is a North Sea example, um, simply because of the availability of the data to us to, to show you this example. It's from a publication by Abbotts, and what you're seeing there is the Fulmar field. Now, as a reservoir engineer, if this field had those faults sealing, it would be very, very hard to apply EOR. Now, in this particular field, um, the recovery factor would have been approximately 50% that would have been expected to recover. This field actually recovered 77%. So the little black lines you see there that look like faults are actually, in a lot of cases, open. So the flow was actually able to flow directly to the produ production wells from the injector. The injectors, in this case, were located down dip, and the, the production wells the black dots are actually the very top of the structure. They were the producers. So in a sense, um, if you have a field pattern like this and you're lucky with the faults, you can generally apply your work too much of a barrier. Now, the economic cutoffs that can kill fields tend to be things like, do we need to drill new wells? Um, how will this affect it? Do we need to do things with the produced water? How will this affect it? Is it economic to do something with the produced water? That sort of uh, impact in terms of economic cutoffs. Now we're just going to cover another example of showing how we can improve these efficiencies. So, generally speaking, um, the first efficiency, which relates obviously to the pore scale, we can improve our flood, water flood through maybe pattern adjustments, wells. Um, low salinity water flooding will also help because it will reduce the, the residual oil and immiscible gas injection. Second efficiency what we're we'll considering would be something along the lines of the drainage efficiency of infill drilling, recompletion, side tracks, and ERD. ERD is simply an extended reach well that we drill. The sweep efficiency is all about offtake management. Now, that could also refer to how we deal with produced water. And in this case, I've mentioned bright water there as well and shutoffs. You can also improve your sweep by reperforations within the reservoir layers. And for those that aren't reservoir engineers and geologists, Perforation is simply 
you go down the well with what we call a, effectively a perforation gun, and you re-perforate, i.e. you set off a series of small explosions that cause fractures in the side wall of the well and increase the flow. As I mentioned there as well, for sweet polymer is very good because polymer is a, an EOR technique that viscifies the water phase and thereby effectively slows down the water and provides um, a much improved um, mobility ratio. Generally speaking, with polymer, you will, um, you will not use that in very light oils because obviously it will actually increase the water breakthrough. So the, the last cutoff again mentioned, uh, the economic cutoff, the artificial lift, facilities upgrades, commercial frameworks and nearby fields. So in some cases, if your field is getting old, Perhaps commercial framework adjustments like bringing in near well, uh, sorry, near, near field opportunities like small fields that another operator owns that you basically tie back to the host installation and produce in that manner. Facilities upgrades, as mentioned, produce water handling. Maybe you can do something to improve your capacity. And also artificial lift. Well, that would be things like pumps and you know activating gas lift later in field life. Retrofitting gas lifts can obviously be costly, so if it's in the well from the start of field life, it's much more helpful. So this is a, a very simple matrix. This is pretty much the heart of a lot of um, different um, schemes out there I've used over the years. This, this is part of OR in the example you see here. What you have as an example is this is your first view, if you like. So as part of the EOR screening process, you do the binary screening, you would identify the candidates, you may be already done your analytical, so you feel comfortable, and now you want to display the results in a, in a manner that allows you to get a visualization of what's there. So you can see in the top x, so the top um, x-axis is basically the main field. It breaks it down by reservoir unit, which again I mentioned critically in screening. You must break it down by reservoir units in order to be useful, and the production of facilities infrastructure of the current state. And what you see along the y-axis is simply the the different techniques that are available. So you would do this as an initial, and then you would move on and perhaps do some further work, speak to some colleagues and bring in some experts. And what you should arrive at is an IOR, EOR matrix, where you have the top candidates identified and basically you can then progress. So in this case, you'll see that there's very specific comments attached to very, very specific EOR. Um, examples like low salinity, as I mentioned earlier, reduces the residual oil and improves the poor scale displacement efficiency. And again, polymer does the same where it improves the, the actual mobility of the fluids. And sweep. So as you can see here, it's a very simple traffic flight system. In red, you're saying you would state maybe in this case for polymer, the permeability is too low, potential injectivity issues. The idea is the orange obviously is just like a traffic light. It's, it's amber, you know. So, so in a sense, the amber means perhaps that you need to investigate it further to assess if the technique is fully viable. And green means go, you know. So in effect it's uh, acceptable for the reservoir. Okay, so in summary, I'd just like to mention that uh, mature fields are increasingly becoming a part of the global portfolio of fields. And field maturity is a determinant factor as to whether or not we can use EOR. I mentioned FMI is a potentially good measure of how you can use it. As a rule of thumb, if your field maturity index is above 0.9, it's unlikely EOR will, will basically be applicable. You're more likely to go towards, I would recommend, IOR like Brightwater. I'd also mention this is quite critical. When you do EOR studies, ideally an experienced subsurface professional with 10 years plus experience, who's very well versed in lab simulation and analytical, should, should lead the studies. Analytical analysis, like binary screening reservoir efficiencies, should always be carried out before you go to the next step, and by that I mean simulation. Simulation studies, as I mentioned before, done as scoping studies without laboratory testing, should not ever be used as a definitive incremental, and I would personally not use them at all. I'd also recommend or to engineers that are interested in, in the process. Um, please call, feel free to contact me for further information. And I'd like to highlight that currently LR run a series of training courses. We'd run the introduction to EOR where we discuss a lot in a lot more detail some of the slides you've seen here today. We also run a chemical and solvent EOR course. Some clients prefer a, a five-day course where they choose a two-day introduction with a specialization in the other three days. We also run other courses in core analysis and formation damage and mechanics. Please uh, contact my colleague Amy Davies if you'd like for information. And if you have any questions that we don't answer today, please feel free to email me and I'll uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.
Ernest, I think that's the presentation concluded. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, we've received some very interesting questions from the audience from the Q&A session, in which I'll start off by reading the first one. The first yeah. question reads, can we predict scaling using simulation? Uh, yes, you can. It's actually it's a, it's an emerging uh, method that actually is very, very, very useful. Personally, I've uh, performed this on one of the largest oil fields in the North Sea for Buzzard and, and, and in another example um, for an academic study for the Miller field that I can discuss. Um, you can take the produced water data that shows you the ions that are being produced. So in the case that I mentioned, barium sulfate, you can see the barium, you can see the sulfate ions, you can history match it just like you would history match fluids in a reservoir simulator. It can give you a prediction and it can also help you to tune the frequency by which you do the SISQ, the scale inhibitor squeeze. And, and ultimately, if you can build a model like this, or, or someone like LR builds it for you, if you can better predict the frequency, you can then therefore cut your OPEX and improve your NPV. Thank you very much for your answer there. We received another interesting question, actually. It reads, does this ORE process work for heavy oil? Yeah, does sorry, could you see that again? So just yep, does oh, the ore process. All oh, right, yeah. sorry, ORE, yeah, or sorry, I'm just so used to calling it that. Um, yes, it does work for heavy oil. Um, we've used it in heavy oil applications before, particularly in the North Sea and Middle East. Right, thank you very much. Um, if I can just remind the audience as well, if you'd like to submit a question, please use the Q and A widget in the top left hand corner of your screen and then click submit. I'll now move on to the next question we've received. It reads, how do I implement laboratory results into full-scale simulation for EOR? Okay, so, so certainly within um, academic institutions and other places, it's pretty much the same workflow. When you perform, I think in this sense, the context is probably something along the lines of you run, you run a core flood. Um, you'll want to get to a situation where you can apply that to your full field model. So you would follow a series of stages principally. Um, assuming you've done your PVT for your particular EOR technique, whether it be CO2 or, um, or something similar, you've got a compositional equation of state. You would use maybe a tool like STARS or GEM, compositional simulators that I frequently use. You will um, basically take the results of this core flood from the laboratory, You'll maybe build the core flood model in the simulator and match the performance. You'll then maybe build another mechanistic model if required to, to gain confidence that you do actually have a reaction. And then once you've got your mechanistic model, you'll then start to build within that domain the sector model. It's important when you model EOR to realize that we need a model that's, as I would call it, fit for purpose. So the model has to be appropriately scaled within the grid resolution to capture the EOR effect. Frequently I've seen this in very large models. I've seen people try to run um, EOR simulation in models that have got 250 feet grid blocks. You need a finer resolution in order to run that in an EOR simulator. Um, it can vary depending on the process. It can also depend upon um, whether or not you've got a layering system or a homogeneous system with an under, underlying aquifer. Um, generally, I have seen models anywhere between 5 and 30 feet in the vertical, depending on the process, depending on also the gas process, you might want fine. Um, you build this sector model, fine, sort of finer scale than the, the conventional full field model you might use for history matching and forecasting. Once you've built your mechanistic model, obviously you build your sector model at a fine scale, prove that you're happy with it, go through the typical fit for purpose checks. If the results are then what, what you desire, you then upscale to what we call a full field model. Um, and you basically um, have to take quite a lot of care but I think generally grid blocks tend to be the challenge. So as, as I mentioned, you would go from laboratory to matching the core flood, to then doing a mechanistic, to then doing a sector model, to then doing the full field model. And effectively, you're, uh, you're scaling up the process as you go along. Very detailed answer. Thank you very much, Stuart. We've got another question here. It reads, if a field is approaching EURF, is EOR viable? So EURF is is what we mentioned. Um, so e EURF is basically the, the ultimate recovery factor. It's a combination. If you've only just, say, brought your field on production, 
It's going to be whatever little bit of cum uh, cumulative production you've got plus your actual um, 2P reserves. Now, EURF at the start of field life can change because obviously if, you're, if your view in terms of the stoic changes, actually what we call the oil in place, and it can also change depending upon your reserves. Reserves, for those of you that aren't reservoir engineers, res reserves are price sensitive. So as the oil price changes, whether it be in, usually on a regional basis, so for Brent crude or for um, maybe Tapia crude, it will affect the actual reserves within the fields in that area. But that, that's kind of like a, a something to be aware of. Um, so the, the question was, I think, when, when, you, when you're nearing EURF, in other words, your recovery factor is almost equal to the EURF, is it viable? Um, it can be viable because sometimes when you did the original study, you might still, um, still might have some potential. Sometimes EUR processes can extend beyond the original EURF by their nature, but generally speaking, that's going to come down to a field evaluation, which is very specific to that field. I saw an evaluation, actually, from a field that had a predicted recovery factor of 35% EURF, and the field was about 34.5 by contrast. And the, it, the field had been redeveloped by a second operator, and they felt that there was this large prize there because they calculated the volume uh, and thought it would, would be possible. Unfortunately, in this case, this field had a basically a sandstone matrix, which is basically just like fine sand for those that aren't engineers and geologists. And within it, it had effectively little boulders, or we would call them clasts. They assumed that the, the clasts themselves would be oil-rich, oil-saturated, that could then be basically tapped to recover. Unfortunately, in this case, um, the, the operator itself had a very tight budget and, and decided that, that it wasn't worth it. And basically, the recommendation I made was that the clasts within it may contain oil, but the problem was they would then need to go into the reservoir and core in order to basically obtain these clasts to get what we call capillary entry pressure. And this is simply a process to actually ensure that any injected fluid, whether it be water, low salinity, or a gas process like CO2, will actually penetrate the clast to release the oil. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, in very specific cases, yes, you can exceed the EURF if there's potential. Thank you very much, Shurat, and thank you all for submitting your questions, but unfortunately, we have run out of time for any more questions. So that just leaves me to thank Shurat for what was a great presentation, and thanks to Lloyd Register for sponsoring this session. To the attendees, you will receive an email tomorrow telling you how you can access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access this through our website, which is www business-review-webinars.com. Please continue to ask questions and interact with the widgets as the on-demand version remains interactive. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please keep an eye out on our website and follow us on Twitter at BRWebinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Thank you once again for listening in and I all hope you have a great day. Thank you.